Welcome to this program that's called Mindfulness for Beginners. I'm delighted to be working with you in this way, and I do so in the hope that whatever it was that drew you to the allure of mindfulness, that that very impulse can be explored and nurtured so that it will grow and develop, because no one comes to a program such as this by accident. There has to be some underlying impulse that longs for a certain knowing or way of being that may feel elusive but is also sensed as highly desirable. Otherwise, you wouldn't even bother to pick up a program such as this. Also, each one of us brings our own genius to such adventures. And we always build on what's come before in our lives, even if much of it was and perhaps still is painful. Our entire past, whatever it's been, when it comes right down to it, becomes the very platform for doing the work of being in the present moment. And it becomes both the work and the adventure of a lifetime not to be trapped in either our past or our ideas, but rather to reclaim the only moment that we ever really have. And that is always this one. And taking care of this one can have a remarkable effect on the next moment and so on the future. In this session, we'll be having a conversation of sorts, although with such a format, I'm going to be the one that winds up doing all the talking. But we will be exploring the whole subject of mindfulness together, as if you'd never heard about it and had no idea what it was or what meditation is and why it might be worth cultivating. We'll cover what it is, how to cultivate it in your life, what its various benefits might be in terms of stress and pain, health and illness. Of course, we can only touch on these topics in this format, and all my comments are only to enhance your motivation to make use of the other session, which guides you in the actual practicing of mindfulness, and to have some kind of framework for understanding why it makes sense to do something which seems as strange and alien as nothing on a regular basis, on a systematic basis, in a disciplined way, to cultivate your own mind and your what I would call your deep inner resources for learning, for growing, for healing, and potentially for transformation of your understanding of who you are and how to live in this world. If you want to go deeper, there are no end of resources. Mindfulness as a subject is an entire universe. It has many, many facets and galaxies. It's infinitely deep and wonderful. And there are fortunately many, many superb teachers, past and present, going all the way back to the Buddha himself and even before the Buddha, whose writings and whose books and for the living ones whose retreats can be invaluable to connect with over the course of this lifetime, your lifetime. Much of what I will be saying is mapped out in my various books and in particular in Full Catastrophe Living and in Coming to Our Senses. So let's begin at the beginning. What is mindfulness? My working definition of mindfulness is that it's paying attention on purpose in the present moment as if your life depended on it, non-judgmentally. Actually, mindfulness is what comes out of paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally and as if your life depended on it, and that is nothing else than awareness. Now, awareness is something that we're all intimately familiar with and yet complete strangers to. So the training in mindfulness that we'll be exploring together is really the cultivation of a resource that's already yours. It doesn't require going anywhere. It doesn't require getting anything. But it does require in some way learning how to inhabit another domain of mind that we are, as a rule, fairly out of touch with, even though, of course, if we didn't have it, we'd already be dead. Mindfulness is often spoken of as the heart of Buddhist meditation. But really, mindfulness is universal because it's about attention and awareness, as I've just said, and attention and awareness are capacities that are shared by all of us. Nevertheless, 
it is fair to say that the most refined and developed articulations of mindfulness throughout history and how to cultivate it come from the Buddhist tradition. But I think by the same token, it's important to keep in mind that the Buddha himself was not a Buddhist. And even the term Buddhism wasn't established until the 18th century. And that term was coined by European religious scholars who had very little understanding of what the statues on the altars of temples were of some guy sitting cross-legged and what they were really about. What those statues and other Buddhist art objects are all about is actually the mind and states of mind. And the Buddha represents a state of mind that can simply be called, and he did speak about it in this way, awake. So the Buddha had some profound insights into the nature of the human mind that apply to any human mind, not just Buddhists or people practicing Buddhist meditation for that matter. Otherwise, really, it would be of no value. I like to think of the Buddha as a, a scientist, a genius of a scientist, really, who had no instruments at his disposal other than his own body and his own mind, and he used them to great advantage to explore the deep questions that he was interested in, like what is the nature of the mind and what is the nature of suffering? And of course, as with any instrument, whether it's a radio telescope or a spectrophotometer or a scale, you have to actually calibrate it first and stabilize the platform on which it sits so that you can get reliable readings. And part of the meditation practice that the Buddha came up with was to actually stabilize and calibrate the mind so that it could do the deep work of penetration. Obviously, if you were trying to look at the moon and you put your telescope on, say, a waterbed and then tried to, you know, find the moon, every time you shifted your posture, even the tiniest little bit, you'd lose the moon in the telescope. So it's the same with the mind. If the mind is going to investigate itself, first you have to learn at least the rudiments of stabilizing the mind enough so that it can actually do the work of paying attention and being aware of what's actually going on beneath the surface of our own mind's activities, which often are what thwart us or distract us or carry us away someplace else, as you'll soon see. So for all these reasons, mindfulness is really universal and doesn't have anything to do with Buddhism in the sense of you have to be a Buddhist in order to practice mindfulness, or for that matter, even that you have to practice meditation in order to cultivate mindfulness. But if you understand meditation in the deepest of ways, then you can't possibly not practice meditation when you're cultivating mindfulness because they are no less than the same thing. It's this deep dimension of awareness that is ours already, but that we just are so unfamiliar with that we can't put it to use at the times in our lives that we need it the most. For close to 30 years now, my colleagues and I at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center's Stress Reduction Clinic have been using mindfulness within mainstream medicine as a profound resource for people facing stress, pain, and illness, and disease, who find that they don't receive full satisfaction from their health care and medical care, who, you could say, fall through the cracks of the health care system, and actually a lot of people fall through the cracks of the health care system and don't get full satisfaction. So the idea of the stress reduction clinic is to challenge people to see if there's not something that they can do for themselves as a complement to whatever their doctors and surgeons and the healthcare system as a whole can do for them to move towards greater levels of health and well-being. And when I say health and well-being, I mean on the deepest and broadest of levels so that ultimately has to do not just with the health of the body or with getting people back to some kind of socially acceptable normal state, but what the true extent of being human actually is and coming to know the mind intimately and to be able to use it in ways that actually cultivate the wisdom and deep qualities of compassion and goodness that lie within us. This work, which has spread to clinics and medical centers and hospitals around the world in the past 10 plus years, is known as Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, or MBSR. 
some of the methods we'll be practicing in the second session are the same as those we use with our patients in the hospital when they take the MBSR program in the stress reduction clinic. But again, that doesn't mean that they're just for people who are experiencing disease or chronic pain. These practices are universal and really are applicable for anybody who is alive. We do not have actually a great track record with the dead, but as long as you're breathing, from our perspective, there's more right with you than wrong with you, no matter what's wrong with you. And so the present moment becomes a really wonderful place to start on this, what I like to call adventure of a lifetime. So as I've been suggesting, when all is said and done, meditation is really about awareness, its qualities and stability and its reliability. It's about bare attention, discernment, clear seeing, and thus wisdom, where wisdom means knowing the actuality of things rather than being caught in your own misperceptions, misapprehensions. And those for all of us are really legion because it's so easy to be caught up in our own belief systems, ideas and opinions and prejudices that kind of form a veil or a cloud that prevent us from actually seeing what's right in front of our faces very often. And of course, many times we leave it to our family members to actually tell us those kinds of things and then we don't believe it anyway. So as I said, it's about bare attention, discernment, clear seeing and wisdom. And at the same time, it's also about an affectionate quality in the attention, an openness, a kindness, an attention that is actually caring. And that is actually a manifestation, I would say, of our heart's intrinsic compassion, not something, again, that we have to get, something that we might realize that we already I won't even say have, that we already are. When I talk about clear seeing, that makes it sound like it's limited to one sense. But seeing in this case represents all the senses, since it's only through our senses that we can be aware of and therefore know anything at all. But from the meditative perspective, especially in Buddhism, but also in science, there's a deep realization that there are actually more than five senses. And Buddhism includes mind as a sixth sense. And by mind, they don't mean thinking. They don't mean just the thinking mind. They mean the mind that is closer to awareness itself, that capacity of mind that knows non-conceptually, that knows where you are right now. You don't have to think about where you are right now. Most of the time, you just know where you are and you know what's come before and you know what's going to happen. You have a sense of orientation in time. You have a sense of orientation in space. We don't think about it at all, but there's an awful lot that we take for granted that we actually know in very deep ways. And so that's what's being pointed to here when we talk about mind as a sixth sense. So clear seeing can also mean clear hearing, clear smelling, clear tasting, clear touching, and clear knowing, which would include knowing what's on your mind and therefore thinking and knowing your emotional state and therefore feeling what you're feeling, whether it be say fear or anger, or sadness, frustration, irritation, impatience, annoyance, whatever. In a parallel unfolding, as I was suggesting, neuroscience also recognizes that there are more than simply the five most recognized senses and that we have other really remarkable senses that are absolutely critical to our lives and well-being, one of which is called proprioception. Proprio just means self. Okay, that means the apprehension or perception of oneself. It's actually the sense of knowing 
and feeling the body's position in space, both statically and in motion. And that sense, although it's very, very rare, can be lost with a certain kind of neurological damage. And then your body just doesn't work, even though it's all the same. And, and I wrote up a case that Oliver Sacks talks about in one of his books, where the woman in question actually lost proprioception. It's a staggering revelation to how little we pay attention to that kind of a sense in our lives and in our bodies. And there's another sense of this kind too, which is called interoception, the sense of knowing how your body's feeling in general, the sense of the felt sense, so to speak, of what is actually unfolding. Again, it's not about thinking. It's an internal embodied feeling that the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio writes about in his books. So that being said, actually there's a lot to be aware of when it comes to our living experience, both outwardly in what you could call the world and inwardly in what you might call the interior world of our being. Since awareness, amazingly enough, can hold it all, both the inner landscapes and the outer landscapes of our experience, there's no fundamental separation between inner and outer, the knower and what's being known. You could say the subject and the object, or even no separation between being and doing. There only seems to be, and there really does seem to be, but that seeming is such a powerful aspect of our experience, especially when we're not paying attention to it in the present moment in a non-reactive, non-judgmental way through mindfulness, that it obscures the underlying unity, which is that there is mysteriously just the seeing, just the hearing, the smelling, the tasting, the touching, the feeling, the knowing, or you could say just awarenessing. Think about that for a moment. Just seeing the miracle of that. Just hearing and really hearing and knowing that you're hearing. That is awareness. Or I like to actually coin the present participle of it. Awareness sing. Not allowed to say that in English, so I like to say it. Awareness sing. And maybe that'll give you a certain tonal or textual feeling for the spirit of mindfulness. It's no longer a noun, it's a verb. And it has a whole dynamics to it by being a verb that is very, very important to this whole domain of looking into who we are as human beings and being able to function in a very, very stressful and sometimes you could say even highly disordered, chaotic, diseased, and sometimes, frankly, insane world. The irony of all this, especially when people come to the medical center with something wrong with them, is that we are already whole, even when we have some kind of disease or some kind of problem. And that's why we say to people that, from our perspective, no matter what's wrong with you, there's still more right with you than wrong with you, as long as you're breathing. So if we're actually already more whole, we're also in the habit of fragmenting the world into inner and outer, this and that, what we like and what we dislike, what we want and what we don't want, and making those kinds of separations, even though they're artificial and even delusional in a profound way, making them still has a profound grip on our habits of thought, emotion, and sensing and knowing. And it's those habits that keep us stuck and prevent us from apprehending the spaciousness, the clarity, the unity of awareness itself, even though really you could say it's right beneath our noses in every moment and always available to us since awareness is ours by birth and by virtue of being human. I think it's important at this juncture to simply say that although I'm doing the talking, there are really no experts when it comes to mindfulness. And so it becomes something that we all actually are embedded in together, if you will. That is, 
the adventure of life and how willing we are to be present in our own lives. So people, you know, sometimes say, well, okay, I get it, mindfulness. Now, everybody's talking about mindfulness nowadays, mindfulness this, mindfulness that. I get it. The idea is I'm supposed to be more present, be more present and less judgmental. Uh, okay, hey, thanks a lot. Why didn't I think about that? Clear sailing from here on, no problem. I'll just be more mindful. I'll be less judgmental. I'll be more in the present moment. Well, all I can say is lots of luck. Turns out it doesn't quite work that way. Mindfulness is not merely a good idea or even a great philosophy, even a great Asian, Oriental, Eastern philosophy. It is actually a way of being and a way of living. So until you implement it, it's not actually yours. It's just one more thought, one more name, one more slogan. And the real challenge here, as we will see together when we move into the actual practice, is that the practice gives us instant access to other dimensions of our life that, as I was suggesting before, have been here all along, but we've just been clueless. We've just been out of touch. And we use that sensory metaphor to actually acknowledge how easy it is to see without seeing, hear without hearing, eat without tasting anything, and zone along on autopilot most of our lives, meanwhile thinking, oh yeah, we, we know what's happening, we know who we are, we know where we're going. And the interesting thing really happens when you start to question who you are and where you're going. How much do we actually know with certainty who we are? Or are we just creating some gigantic story for ourselves? And then when the story seems to be going well, we're just tremendously happy and, you know, full bore ahead into what's next. And when the story sort of takes a corner, turns a corner, or for one reason or another, maybe even from early childhood, is a story of mayhem and disaster and abuse or neglect or not being seen, then the story that we tell ourselves is one of like, you know, being completely imprisoned or completely unworthy or completely unintelligent or whatever it is that we tell ourselves to create this story that there's no hope for us. And what mindfulness is saying is this is just all thinking. It's highly supported by, you know, all sorts of evidence that you can marshal from your past, why you're no good or why you're the greatest thing to, you know, hit the planet since sliced rye bread or whatever it is. But all of those are just like, you know, obsessions around kind of self-centeredness that when you begin to question it or look at who is doing all this talking inside my own head, you realize that you don't even know. And if you want to actually taste wholeness, which is the root meaning of the word healthy, the word healing, and the word uh, holy, H-O-L-Y, the irony is that it's here in all moments, this rotation in consciousness that allows us to actually see and realize that we're seeing, to think and to know what's on our minds, to feel, to experience emotion, and to be in relationship to it in a way that is actually wise and is actually self-compassionate and doesn't saddle ourselves with stories of how great we are or stories of how horrible we are or inadequate we are, that then kind of serve like cement blocks that keep us kind of sinking in some ocean or some morass of our own, to a very large extent, our own creation. So from that point of view, it's not like meditation is saying you should know who you are. It's much more, can you question who you are and be comfortable with not knowing? Because when it comes right down to it, people say, well, who are you? And you say, well, I'm John, you know, Kabat-Zinn. Well, that was just a name that my parents gave me when I was born, John. They could have given me another name. Would I be the same person or not? Shakespeare had a lot to say about that. Would a rose by any other name smell as sweet? And the same for your age, your accomplishments, everything else. It's not, it doesn't add up to the person. The person is something else, something more mysterious, something, you know, that is bigger, bigger, 
Walt Whitman said, I am large. I contain multitudes. It's actually true. We're like universes in ourselves. We're, we're huge, but we tend to contract and think of ourselves in small, contracted ways. And the power of mindfulness is the power of unlocking those views, those perspectives that in some sense keep us thinking we know who we are and not paying attention to the actuality of who we are and also the beauty of being alive and the possibilities of a life that is lived mindfully. Not knowing, by the way, is not such a bad thing. It's basically just being honest. Of course, we're scared to even say in class, you know, when we're in school that we don't know something because we're afraid to look stupid. But actually, all great scientists have to admit what they don't know because otherwise they're never going to discover anything meaningful because the new discovery happens at the interface between what is known and what's not known. And if you're completely preoccupied with what is already known, you can't make the leap into that other dimension that's often called creativity or imagination or poetry or whatever it is that allows us to see a hidden order in things that until it's seen, it ain't seen. And it therefore is hidden. And then when someone else sees it and you say, oh my God, why didn't I see that? Well, that's because in some sense, everybody has their own karma. So you can't see necessarily what somebody else is to be seen, but maybe you can see what's yours to be seen. And that may be a lifetime's work to discover what is my trajectory? What is my job on the planet with a capital J? What is my heart yearning for? What is my body really asking of me in this moment? And then feeding those dimensions as if that was really the only work worth doing on the planet. And you could make the argument that that's true. When we speak about the word mindfulness, by the way, I want to make it very clear that in all Asian languages, the word for mind and the word for heart are the same word in all Asian languages. So when you hear the word mindfulness, you have to equally well to really understand what mindfulness is about, hear the word heartfulness. And that's why we often speak about affectionate attention or being gentle and compassionate with yourself because this is not some kind of cold, hard, discerning, witnessing, peeling back, you know, to find something. That's kind of, you can feel the forcing, doing elements of this. Meditation is really not about doing, it's about being, as in human being. And then the interesting thing is then people say, well, yeah, but then I'll never get anything done. I got all this stuff to do. How am I ever going to meditate? I mean, it's just, but the fact of the matter is that it's not that meditation's about like navel gazing and never functioning in the world or doing anything of real value. It's letting the doing come out of the being. And then that's some other doing because it's really informed by these other dimensions of being that come out of knowing the mind, that come out of coming to our senses, that come out of being able to see beneath the surface of appearances or hear what's really being said by a patient or by your child or by a look that flashes across somebody's face when you've said something gauche but you don't really realize it and an arrow's gone into the other person's heart and you're clueless about it. Mindfulness can actually hold all of this in such a way that, one, you might not shoot that arrow in the first place after a while, but if you do, you'll see the effect of it and you'll have enough integrity and what some people call character, so to speak, to actually apologize and say, whoops, I'm sorry, that was, a, I don't know what happened, that was like another moment of mindlessness. And by the way, when you practice mindfulness a lot, the first thing you notice is how mindless we are so much of the time. And that's where the non-judgmental piece comes in. Because if you're going to hammer yourself every time you move out of the present moment, well, you're going to be hammering yourself a lot. And maybe it's time to sort of put down the hammer, stop beating on ourselves to sort of castigate ourselves for not living up to some kind of ideal. And in some way, just how about just being honest? How about when we blow it, just, okay, I just blew that. But we're aware of blowing it, and the next moment we have a lot of different options of how to handle that. That's what meditation is about. It's not about, oh, if I meditate, then I'll be one way. I'll always be compassionate. I'll be like the Dalai Lama. I'll be like Mother Teresa. I'll be like whoever your spiritual guru hero is of the moment. You don't have a snowball's chance in hell of being like the Dalai Lama or Mother Teresa or any other hero, Gandhi, whatever, 
the only person that you have the possibility of being like is yourself. And that's really the challenge of mindfulness is to be yourself. And of course, the irony is you already are. But what does that mean? And how could we embody that knowing and be that knowing moment by moment by moment by moment by moment? As the proverbial stuff hits the proverbial fan, as we go through mind states from boredom to impatience to irritability to grandeur to whatever it is that we're, you know, what about a little bit of joy in the process and be aware of that? What about a little bit of compassion for other people or loving kindness? What about a little bit of loving kindness towards ourselves? And what about noticing that the noticing itself can hold all of it and isn't really in pain when, when we say, oh, I'm suffering so much. The awareness of the suffering that allows us to say I'm suffering so much, ask yourself sometimes. Just look deeply, don't, not through thought. Is my awareness of my suffering suffering? Is my awareness of my fear and trepidation and worry and anxiety, is it frightened? Is my awareness of pain in pain? Is my awareness of my sadness or depression or lack of, you know, feeling of being worthy. Is that awareness unworthy? Moment by moment, we have opportunities to step out of that storyline of thinking and getting hijacked by our emotions and our ideas and opinions, our likes and dislikes, and be with the actuality to rest in the awareness that is already your partner, your ally, your birthright. And meditation is cultivating it. It's cultivating it. It's like planting seeds and then watering the seeds and then protecting them. Yes, you do have to protect them because they'll get trampled by the cows, you know, before they're really big or peed on by the dogs or whatever it is. You need to take care of your meditation practice, especially as a beginner in the early stages because it is precious and it can be easily trampled down or it can be easily sort of slighted by other people if you start telling them, oh, you know, I'm really into meditation. Now I've started meditating. Yeah, it's going. How's it going? Well, it's going really well. You start talking a good talk about meditation and after two or three weeks, you ain't going to be meditating anymore. You waste all your energy, yak, yak, yakking how great meditation is. Pretty soon you don't have any time to meditate. You're too much into the PR of it all. So we tell our patients in the stress reduction clinic, listen, for the first five or ten years, don't tell anybody you're meditating. Just every time you get the impulse to tell somebody you're meditating, go and get your butt on a cushion and meditate some more. And of course, it doesn't have to be on a cushion. Find meditating on a chair, lying on the floor, and we'll be doing that in other programs. I think it's also important to say that there's an ethical foundation to the cultivation of mindfulness, and this is non-trivial. Mindfulness is really related to generosity, to compassion, to openness. You can't practice without feelings of some degree of generosity, openness, and compassion. And the foundation of all of it is a kind of orientation of non-harming. You want to really, like, be real with yourself and not just pound on yourself or hammer on yourself some more every time you don't live up to your own self-created, usually unrealistic standards and then beat yourself up over every falling down that you experience. It's the foundation is a spirit of non-harming. And by the way, that, that's not so loosey-goosey or so airy-fairy or so, you know, new age spiritual or anything like that. It's the core of the Hippocratic Oath in medicine. First, do no harm. So if you cultivate that kind of attitude towards yourself, then when you put your butt down on the chair or the cushion, you'll know why you're here. It won't be, oh, now I'm going to do some big exercise and... Uh, follow the instructions and hope I get to some great place. There's no great place to get to. You're already in the greatest place you're ever going to be, and that's this moment. And if you miss it, well, it's a moment of your life. Don't worry, because you got this moment now. The other one's already gone. So how long is it going to take for us to actually wake up to the fact that we have nothing but moments to live? Now, why am I emphasizing an ethical foundation to meditation at all? Well, 
It's really, as I've been suggesting, because the mind can wind up embroiled in very unhealthy states of mind and easily in some way get caught up in what might be most appropriately described as delusion, although we wouldn't see it that way. And when we are driven by a kind of preoccupation with ourselves, you know, in the smallest sense of the word, those personal pronouns, I, me, and mine, my life, my ambition, my career, my needs, I, 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 me, 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 mine, my, mine, a kind of creation or generation of the self-centered orientation towards life, it can actually cause huge amounts of harm to yourself and of course, to others when your needs are in conflict with other people's needs. And just think about nations that get into that kind of thing or politicians or on any level that you want to look at it. When you fall into a certain kind of smallness in the way you identify yourself, then the danger is that you can do a huge amount of harm. So when we say that one of the core motivations here and the core foundation of meditation practice and mindfulness practice is non-harming, that allows us to actually take an entirely different perspective on how we're going to live our lives and even what our deep needs may be. Our deep needs may be very, very different from what we think our deep needs are or our desperate longings or our strong feelings that I've got to have this. I've got, my life just will not be complete unless this happens or unless that doesn't happen. So we can become prisoners of our own likes and dislikes, our own ideas and opinions, our own impulses and perceptions. And nobody's kind of minding the store to ask the deep questions of, is this even really true? Or am I falling into a misperception, misapprehension, misunderstanding? and therefore mistaking reality and creating, you know, mistakes all over the place. <laughs> 